Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cabaret Secrets. My name's Gary Williams, and today's guest has programmed over 50 mixed arts festivals in seven locations all over the world, as well as sung many a song, scripted and introduced over 100 orchestral concerts. He's interviewed dozens of writers, written several productions for the stage, and commissioned over 100 new pieces of work. Wow, it's no surprise that in November 2012 he was presented with an award for his outstanding contribution to British Arts Festivals. I'm very pleased to introduce Stuart Collins. Welcome to Cabaret Secrets. Good afternoon. It sounds great when you hear your biography read out like that. Actually, and I, I, you definitely have a radio voice. I can hear you have a nice voice for presenting. <laughs> OK. Yes, I've, I've, I've had a brown voice all over BBC Radio, yes. Yeah. So you've been a busy man, but you started off life as a performer. Exactly right. Um, fresh out of university, I sang a vocal group for, for many a year, for 12 years. Um, Cantabile, they now call themselves Cantabile. A stroke the London Quartet because we discovered that not only did people not pronounce Cantabile correctly in Britain, they didn't pronounce Cantabile correctly anywhere in the world. And so it became one of those really, really boring things that even in Italy, where and it's an Italian word, they didn't pronounce it properly. So you just think you were saddled with this annoying name which someone's mum thought was great at the time, but then <laughs> you travel around the royal thinking, oh God. Yeah, anyway, no, but no, 12 really, really fascinating years. I mean, tr as any performer knows it's it's fantastic to have a, a passport to travel the world for free which is basically about being paid to go and see the world i always regarded going to the airports uh, to fly off to do a gig as i was still felt i was on holiday uh, and then suddenly i got there and thought well i've got to sing now but th this is a pretty castle or that's a beautiful town or let's go and do some shopping here so yeah no, it's it's just to spend 12 years being paid to do that thing you love and to see the world you know it's just it's a, it's a wonderful wonderful way if you can make it work so how did you go from a singer working all over the world to somebody programming music and arts festivals all over the world. Yeah, interesting one. Um, I mean, I, I basically having done 12 years on the road uh, with with a vocal group, I, I my feeling was I'd sort of done what I needed to do, what I wanted to do. Also, young family thing, you know, maybe out to get to know my kids because uh, that was something that was beginning to become an issue with uh, my then wife but also just one of those things that uh, I, I had a number of ideas what I wanted to do outside the group the group itself was very successful so we were full time so I just felt if I was going to do anything else I had to had to step out and do it myself I wanted to do broadcasting I wanted to do um, uh, other sorts of things, oh, my own performing but the, the getting into fe festival directing which is what <laughs> happened was was slightly serendipitous in that Obviously, I'd performed at a lot of festivals in the UK with the group. And then um, one of the last ones I'd done with the group uh, the summer before I, I left was uh, Henley Festival. And it just so happened, shortly after I'd left the group, I saw an advert saying they wanted an artistic director for Henley Festival. I thought, well, I've just been there. Um, came up with what I think must have been a relatively credible idea for, for how to do it. I, I decided I wanted to become an arts theme park. You know, it wasn't supposed to sound glib. That you, it was a, you were going to get, you're going to get all sorts of music. You're going to get jazz. You're going to get comedy. You were going to get classical music. You were going to get art, sculpture, street theatre. And I, I just thought it was quite a neat idea. It developed on what was there already, but uh, it obviously came over well enough in. Um, in the interview and of course I'd always been the, the guy who did put the programmes together I was always the sort of administrator within the group in Cantabile so I was quite used to sort of putting things together and so suddenly the idea of putting together a festival wasn't that different to putting together a concert or a cabaret where you know you have to have beginning middle end high spots funny spots sad bits you know you, you have to have all of those contrasts so that by the end the the audience has had a journey at a festival evening just as much they've had a journey in, in a cabaret evening or a concert. So you're the person who we as cabaret performers need to impress if we want to work at one of your festivals. Well, that's true. I mean, I, do, yeah, I, suppose, I, I suppose that's how it is, yes. I mean, my job is to find the right performers for my events. OK, I, I'm now involved in a, a series of events, all of which have different audiences, but my job is to find things that those audiences will love. They won't 
necessarily expect to love, but th I've got to put my finger on the pulse of that audience and think, ah, oh, right, you will really like these people. So what I have to do is I have to identify, firstly, people who will sell tickets, because that's really crucial. Uh, there's no point in me running a festival if I book things that are so obscure, so avant-garde, or so just wrong that we don't sell tickets, we go out of business and nobody gets No matter how good they may be. Exactly. I have booked some wonderful acts who sold very, very few tickets, and I've just learned from that. It breaks your heart, but... Exactly. And, in fact, you have to go out there. I mean, sometimes I, I, I will just say that... Um, you know, I'm going to book this act, and it's going to be an act of education for my audience. Mm -hmm. And so even if everybody leaves at the end of the evening saying, oh, you know, I wish some more people had been here, I'm going to mm -hmm. tell everybody about it, you've sort of done your job, but you can't do that very often. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have to find acts that will sell tickets, acts that will really entertain, and will entertain in the way the audience wants to be entertained. Uh, and and it, it's, it's getting those, that combination of factors right. Do you find it a challenge to find artists who they may be very good practitioners, they may be very good technicians at what they do, maybe very good technical singers or musicians, but have difficulty connecting with an audience? And does that even matter at a festival? I mean, I know it matters if I'm doing a at a corporate event where we are. We're at the Hurlingham Club in the bar, and you're, you're programming just a little event here, a private party here today, aren't you? And, and of course, this kind of event, of course, we've got to connect with people, but. At a festival, does it really matter? Can we a little bit be a bit more self-indulgent? Uh, to me, you've identified the thing which is most important to me, th that communication thing. That um, What I don't respond to ever when I receive information from an artist is a CD or, a, or even, even actually looking at a YouTube clip or something like that, uh, because to me that doesn't tell me whether the, the, the artist is communicating. That tells me that they're quite good in the recording studio or they had a good gig once. But, <laughs> but I, I, I find it quite... I, I quite, find it quite hard booking acts who I actually haven't gone to see myself. Uh, and I, I very rarely actually take recommendations because um, I've had rec made, friends made recommendations or colleagues made recommendations. It's always based on their assumption of what my audience is as opposed to my knowledge of my audience, yes. which is, does, it may sound arrogant, but it's, it's the most important thing for a booker to know his audience. Very often, I say very often, Occasionally, when an artist has failed at one of my gigs, in other words, a comedian who hasn't been laughed at, a singer who hasn't been well received, I will actually normally apologise to the artist because it's normally my fault. It's normally my fault. I've got the act wrong. Mm. I shouldn't have booked you. I, I saw you. It, and it's happened occasionally. I've seen loads and loads of things in Edinburgh. I then take them somewhere else. And then you suddenly realise the Edinburgh audience is all sort of 25 to 35-year-old students uh, um, who are, you know, out for a really good time, probably half, half pissed. Mm. And then you take it to an audience of 35 to 45-year-old middle-class people who live in Exeter, mm. and it doesn't work. Mm. And it's not that artist's fault. It's my fault because I should have seen that it was the wrong artist in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. But what are you looking for most then when, you, when you're trying to find new talent? I'm looking for <clears throat> bloody good act. You know, that they ha if, if they're a singer, they have to be a great singer. They have to be a, if they're a comedian, they have to be a great comedian. If they're a, a, any kind of speciality act, it has to be something that you, there's a sort of, all oh, right, you're different from everybody else. And I think that's a one crucial thing that you, you have to have something that sets you out from everybody else. It's just don't be another one of those. Find your own thing. But I suppose I'm also looking for that thing that, of drawing the audience in, of actually that special spark. It's, and, and this is something I, you, Gary, know as well as anybody, that it's not just the songs, it's what happens between the songs. In fact, between the songs, it's almost more important than the songs themselves because you create the mood, you create the ambience. And so... To me, the dream artist is the one who sits down at the piano, plays beautifully, sings beautifully, or whatever, and then stands up and really charms the audience, or is funny, or is rude to the audience. It doesn't matter. It's just that thing of between the songs, the glue of the act. You know, every minute you're on stage is a vital minute. You know, you can lose an audience at any point. And it's amazing. There's one artist I won't talk to you about, I won't give her a name, but she's a wonderful singer, one of the greatest voices in our. Know, our business. Um, she does really interesting material and then ruins it by just not knowing what to say after the songs. Whereas there's lots to say about these songs, but she, but it's it's not it's it's about finding herself 
as well as herself in the music. You know, it's one thing to be a great interpreter of a Cole Porter song, but you've actually then got to be yourself between the songs. You've got to find a personality, a character. And I think quite often singing actors, singing actresses are very used to getting into a song and, and acting it brilliantly. And you've then got to keep that energy going. You've got to then have a character between the songs. Hopefully it'll be a very honest character. It'll be you or an extension of you. But that is just so important. Is it hard to find? Yes. I th it's interesting. You say uh, we're sitting here in Hurlingham Club where I've booked an act for tonight. Um, I... I it's a, it's a wonderful comedian called Jim Tavery. Um, is he works with a double bass. He's been around for years. He, he always works. I, I haven't known an audience which doesn't doesn't love him. There, are those kind of acts. I, I guess I've probably I know about twelve acts of all of the ones I've ever worked with, who I doubt would ever fail. And it's that thing you you know that confidence that. A, he does what he does very, very well, he's very adaptable, he is very funny, he's charming, and he will work. Uh, there's another chap, I, I don't know if you've come across him, he's a, he's a sort of juggler, stroke, variety artist, comedian, chap called Steve Rawlings. I've heard uh, the name. Yes. He's someone I would book anywhere because he's just infectious, he's funny, everybody loves him, it's no question. And as I say, there are about a dozen of those people who I would simply book any time under certain circumstances you know I need I need someone who I know is going to entertain and I've worked you know I've done 50 festivals as you say I must I've worked with thousands of people but it actually narrows down to quite a small number who are absolutely on the money every single time so is, is anybody listening to this that is desperate that would, be, that would love to work at one of your festivals how do they go about trying to convince you that they're worth booking and I suppose the first thing for anybody listening to this is before you send Stuart or anybody anything, make sure you've got something worth selling. That's yes. the first thing, isn't it? Well, everybody thinks they've got something worth selling, of course, and you have to. Um, but I'm afraid I, I'm one of those arbiters who decide whether or not you have, or at least as far as my audience is mm. concerned. Um, the, thing, the thing to do is, is to make sure I notice you, because obviously um, I... You know, I, I, I get lots of stuff. I'm on mailing lists for every single theatre, every single cabaret venue in London, so I spot, I know what's out there all the time. And, I, and I, I tend to actually go and see things that I want to see rather than responding to things that are sent to me. Mm. So the, I think the key there is when you perform, make sure you know people about it. And when you perform, make sure that what you say about yourself is really exciting. Because obviously you're not, you're not just going to get audiences along, you are going to get bookers, because bookers do go out and look. Bookers need all the time to go and find, find artists and find new things, refresh the people they use, look for the next new thing. So as I say, when you perform, Make sure everybody knows about it. But how sure. do we do that? We find you on, uh, you know, the, on the internet. We find you your contact. Do you do you want people to email you things, post them to yeah. you, or I how do you, how, what's I, the for, what's the best way to communicate with you if we don't actually know who you are? We haven't had a personal yes. introduction. I really don't want to have get things in the post these days. It's interesting. Um, it, it, a few years ago, that wouldn't be the same. No, it's it's find out. It's a lo and it's legwork. It really is legwork. Find out those festivals cabaret bars, art centres, theatres, you know, wherever you would be likely to work, find out who books them and, and email them and tell them when you can be seen, you know, so if you've got a gig coming up in October, at the end of October, at the beginning of September, middle of September, six weeks away, tell everybody you know who might be interested in you that you're on. Now, obviously, I'm not going to travel to Yorkshire to go and see stuff because I'm based in London, but I, I, I make it very clear to people who contact me, <coughs> excuse me, that um, if they, you know, I will travel anywhere, sort of some within reasonable distance of London, if I'm interested in an act. So, but I, I won't do it if people contact me two days in advance or a week in advance. I might if they contact me a month in advance or two months in advance. Now tell me what specifically, if they're sending you an email, if I'm, if, so I've, I've figured out that you exist and I've got your email address off a website somewhere, so I'm going to make contact with you, what should I put in the first email? Do you want to see, you know, photos, uh, bios, uh, YouTube, uh, yes. clips? 
clip and all? Do you want to see everything in there and a little bit of text or quite a lot of text? Or how, how bored are you going to get? How yes. quickly are you going to get turned off? I, I'm going to get turned off quite quickly, but I, I want a YouTube clip, definitely. Um, I want... I want briefly to find out what you do and I want to see a really good picture I really want to see a good picture I no, want a that. recent one as well eh? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> have you, have you, has that ever happened you've turned off and thought, oh god you've aged 20 years since oh, that photograph absolutely absolutely <laughs> uh, I've, I've don't look at me when you no, say no, that. No. <laughs> I sat in a concert that I'd booked once um with my PR colleague who we'd been selling the show on and I'm, I won't talk about names and I'm sorry for being sizist but there was this very attractive photograph of a, a, of a singer and a pianist that I'd received and quite an interesting looking programme and I have to say this was at the beginning of my booking career and I wouldn't make this mistake again but um, I booked them on the strength of that looks like interesting repertoire and yeah you look as though you can carry this off and on waddled to the stage something that I mean I just sat well the two of us just sat with our head in our hands for an hour and a quarter <laughs> while this this went on you didn't know they were sponsored by Pucker Pies did you? <laughs> Sort of <laughs> Dunkin' well, Donuts. Was, yeah. <laughs> the relationship. Oh God, that could be me one day. Um, so they're going to send you. Uh, even though, so even you're saying with a YouTube clip, it has its limitations. You're not going to book somebody just off a YouTube clip, but it's it's critical to have one. How long should the clip be? Oh, four minutes. Okay. Yeah, yes. And would you prefer it to show uh, like a whole song and a little bit of chat, or would you prefer to see sort of ten seconds of this, twenty seconds of that? That's a very good question. There's nothing more annoying than a YouTube clip that jumps about a lot and also has lots of wacky camera angles. I mean, that, that might make a good YouTube, YouTube clip for a punter, but for me it's just annoying because I don't get an impression. I want to see this person, a sample of them performing, what they look like on stage, how they move. I want to see, I want to see a song, I want to hear some banter. A whole song? Uh, yes, or at least yes. or half a yeah, song? Because uh, um, uh, yes. four minutes, you know. I mean, I, my repertoire, I might do a comedy song in my set, I might do a nice ballad, I might do a big swing number, I might do. A, I might have, I might think, well, I want to show my four minutes, so yeah. I need to show you a little bit of chat. And if I'm showing you chat, I mean, maybe the setup for a song can take three minutes, so yeah. hey, what am I going to show you? Ten yeah. seconds of the chat? I mean, it's, it's hard, well, right? Well, it is hard, and, and I would say that if it's worth, if it's good banter, and it means the track, you know, it runs for five and a half minutes. Mm. Don't cut it because okay. it's good material. It, you know, I'll be drawn to that. I'm not going to turn off if I'm enjoying an introduction. The thing is, just to make it relevant. Now, it has a whole song. It doesn't need to be a whole song, but maybe if you know, if you do sad and, and funny in in your set, you know, there's a lot of contrast, and one song won't sell you. Half a song with some banter, and another half a song. But it, it's just that thing of don't. I need to get an impression of, of how you treat your material. So, and if you just give me 15 seconds, I won't know. Whereas if I get in a minute and a half, I will. You'll get a feeling. So it can be done very quickly. But uh, Making films, getting shows filmed can be very expensive. Um, is it better for a, a relatively new artist that's not terribly well established and doesn't have deep pockets, is it better for them to show you a, a quite a rough uh, video that maybe they've done on an iPhone that, that's, you know, of, of a show? Is it better for them to show you that or should they just not show you that and wait another year till they've saved up enough money to have a, a nice camera on a tripod? Well, I, I was going to answer differently, but I re as you were asking that question, I realised that actually, whilst a, uh, a film using an iPhone is probably fine in some senses, the fact you're filming yourself on an iPhone rather than having the resources to get in a proper camera and do it properly says where you are in the profession mm. so I might by seeing someone who's filmed on an iPhone I might see a brilliant act and mm. think mm. well I'm going to get in here mm. on the other hand I might just see someone who I think well mm. they're, they're sort of quite a long way down the ladder still let's just give them a chance and by the time you produce a decent video clip it's almost like filmed. producing a post, uh, a, a, an old, f before we were, everything was digitised, it's like producing, a, giving you a brochure on really cheap paper as opposed to a fabulous, glossy, laminated card, isn't it? Yes, that's right. I mean, the way you present it yourself says a lot about you. So, so it, yeah. It, yeah. content is obviously important, but the, the substance is there has to be something yes. there as well. That's, well uh, that's a very good parallel to go back to print materials, because I think that there, there was a time when people were getting more and more and more glossy 
democracy mm -hmm. uh, because you had to and and in a sense that's why your clip video clips now have to be more and more slick in a way f so that we know where you are in the profession. Because uh, mm. if I see some sort of moving thing filmed on, a, on an iPhone with lots of background noise and someone eating sweets, I'll realize that you're not playing the Palladium, you know. If I send you uh, my email and I'm sending you my bio, do you prefer it as a Word document a attached or do you want it as text? And do you want the full thing or do you want just a few lines? I really don't read much about biogs. Okay. I, I, what I want to know... That's the what? first thing you look at, is it? You click on the YouTube, is that the I, first thing? The first thing I'll do is I'll look at the picture Second thing, I'll look at what do they do. So that I'm just I need a brief, brief um, description of, of what you do. Now, some cases it can be bloody obvious because I do, you know, I do a cold port and I'm fine. That's clear. Um, but uh, that, and then the YouTube click. It, it, the YouTube is almost the first visit, the first stop. You know, I'll say, I'm interested or I'm not, and I might, I won't get as far as the YouTube. And how sense. do you do? You, because it's interesting, isn't it, that there are people out there. They're desperate to get booked, to, particularly at the more prestigious places, and it's really hard for them to make contact with the person that's booking. But at the same time, you as an artistic director, you're desperate to find fantastic new talent as well, aren't you? And it's sort of so you kind of want people to bother you and send you stuff but you're just looking to sift all the way you want to make it you want you need us to make it easy for you to find the good stuff in that's there that's exactly right yes you're so right i i really want to i want to know who you are yeah uh, just i'm i'm waiting to be impressed mm -hmm. i'm waiting for someone to, to sort of show that i've got to book them you know mm -hmm. so that's what that's what everything has to be angled at the uh, the, as soon as I, I see something, I want to be interested. So it's very often a visual, visual image because I think the way people present themselves says so much. If you have, if you've got good images of yourself, it says how your or it talks about your awareness of yourself on stage. Because if you if you know you've got to look good in a in an image, you you know you've got to look good on stage, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So that's that's the quickest thing. But you're right. I, 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 we're waiting to be impressed. Uh, make it easy for us. Yeah. Are you going to be upset if we keep uh, badgering you, sending you lots of emails, trying to phone you up, or are you somebody that would always respond to everything that you get and say yes or no? I will very, I will almost invariably respond, uh, which I know I'm quite unusual in that. But I've just, having been a singer, I just, I just know how it's how depressing it can be mm. to send out, you know, five thousand mails and get you know, one response back, you know, I'd far rather someone says, lovely, thank you, good luck, no chance. Um, and it's not to say that they're not a good artist, yes, it's just not right for you. absolutely right. I, I will make it pretty clear in my response, what, I, I very rarely say no, I'm very bad at saying no to people, because I, I don't like to discourage. Because you're a nice man, <laughs> yes. you're too nice I don't for like this business. business. What, what I tend to say is, Thank you for your information. I will get in touch with you if an opportunity arises. Mm. That's that's my speak for rare though it may be yes. that such an opportunity does arise. <laughs> but it's a nice way of saying yes. thanks. Yes. Um, but if you if it's something that you are you look at and you're excited about, I, I presumably you're 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 right in there. Yeah, I will immediately. I mean, my, yes, you know if I'm interested. If I ask for when you're performing, because mm. that's mm. my first question. I'm interested. I want to see you. Mm. Tell me where you are. And sometimes it can probably take I mean we all have such busy schedules so it could take you maybe even a year to see a, a show shouldn't yeah. it of a performer oh yes it really doesn't matter if that show isn't for nine months because you know I, I mean I an artist wants to fill their diary as soon as possible but I, I have booked people probably two and a half years after I've seen them because the opportunity hasn't arisen until then, or similarly, uh, you know, I've I've had I've got dates in my diary for going to see people in 2014 at the moment. You know, where they've got a gig in February. That's the first chance I've got to see them. It means I almost certainly won't be able to book them in 2014. But you know, then there's 2015. So it's it's just a permanent process. You know, I see stuff all year round. But I actually, at the moment, October 2013, am booking next year's summer events. So once I get to the end of October. Anything else I see after that is actually going to be for other events. It's certainly not going to be for the festivals. If singers are presenting themselves to you, does it make a difference? Uh, are you more or, like less or less likely to book them if they have uh, more musicians with them? I mean, do you prefer people that come along just with a pianist or a trio, or do you, do you prefer big bands or orchestras or what? Well, that d then depends on their profile. I mean, if, if a well-known singer wants to bring a, a, a 
12-piece band, I can almost certainly afford it because I can afford the ticket price that would include a big band mm. and a well-known singer. It, 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 it t tends to boil down to money, to be honest, that uh, if, I haven't, if, if the audience won't have heard of you, I'm not going to put you in a big venue and I'm not going to charge a lot of money. Therefore, you either have to accept you're not going to get paid very much, or or you pair your forces down. Mm. Um, so it, it's it's a very practical one. That you know, a, an unknown singer offering me 25 piece big band um, is not going to get booked because I can't afford to spend six or seven thousand pounds on 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 a concert where I won't get an audience unless the repertoire they're doing is just so so much of interest that that alone tells the concert. Is it worth somebody contacting you direct or do you prefer agents? I mean, should somebody, should an artist try and find a good agent first or should they just come to you direct? Either, to be honest. I mean, there are agents... I mean, agents are useful, obviously, because they tend to... They, we, I develop relationships with agents, therefore they know the kind of thing I want, therefore they will filter what they send me, because they'll know there's certain things there's just no point telling me about, because I'll never book them, I haven't got a venue that works for that. My, they, they'll know that kind of relationship. But I think I probably book probably 70% through agents, but 30% direct with artists. So it is worth it as an artist coming direct to me, yeah. Mm. So is the, do you think the future's hopeful and rosy for cabaret artists? I think so. Or not, you can say no, either. No, no, well, no, no, quite. I have an opportunity to say no, resign, go home, go to bed. <laughs> um, I, I think... I, th I think there has been a, a renaissance in cabaret. I, th I think... I, th I think... I think the, the fact there are so many... Uh, I mean, there's a, fi a financial thing. There are lots of small rooms now where they have really sort of bustling lives, you know, and good audiences. People love that intimate experience of cabaret because it is a special thing. Um, I, I think making a living is a really... It's a challenge, but I think there are opportunities there. Um, and course it's the, the other thing is if you've got to do it you've got to do it so you know my advice to anybody is if you've got if you've got the mojo go for it you know, just do it follow it you know you'll kick yourself if you don't thank you for listening to this cabaret secrets podcast if you've got any comments or questions please visit cabaretsecrets.com where you'll also find details of the cabaret secrets book an indispensable guide on how to create your own show travel the world and get paid to do what you love 